On the is um, religion child abuse of a form. I mean, I think that maybe the um, most graphic uh, demonstration of this would be in the development from whatever pregnancy to childbirth. There are a load of chemical pathways that actually um, can mess you up on a metabolic level, which is why you know women are advised not to drink during pregnancy and that sort of thing. It actually affects the developmental trajectory. Mm -hmm. But from when you're born to about when you're 18, there's a whole lot of actual development that's going on in the brain. Mm -hmm. And if you actually, you can, if you like, psychologically scar people during that time, um, and it does a disproportionate amount of damage. I don't actually have any um, data to, to um, back this up, but... Um, there is a reason why we have the expression, um, give me the boy until he's seven and I will give you the man. Uh, children are very, almost like a sponge, they absorb um, so much and they are so susceptible to this potential form of indoctrination. I mean, Andy will be able to talk much more about this than I can. But no, I, I think the plasticity of the... Um, the, the damage that you can do to the brain of someone once they've reached maturity is far less than when you can, if you do it during the development of the brain, it does more damage than when, if you do the same thing once they've reached maturity. Yeah? Andy? No, they're, 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 we, already have, we already have studies. Uh, if you are interested in this, there's a researcher at Harvard whose name I think is Teichner, T-E-I-C-H-N-E-R, a review article about the impact that abuse has on the developing brain. And so we know, and, and these are cases of severe physical sexual abuse, and it's a, it's a wonderful review article that lays out what happens. And I don't think we're far away from having research at that kind of level done on some of the children who are in these uh, cults. It's obviously going to be politically loaded, but... I hope we'll get that research. I think we will, and I think that will, again, just add more and more weight to the idea that religion is not particularly good. We've shown Andy, it. Have, we've I shown it. One, 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 one moment, Aaron, if I may. Um, yeah, just Andy, one, we, I, we, we've shown it in those adults. that When we were talking before the show started, in the adults, their hippocampus damage, uh, you're going to see it in children. Andy, yeah. I, I, I'm terribly sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but just, no. just one moment, Aaron. Um, I noticed this time, it's four minutes before we would officially end the show. Andy, are you happy to stick with us for another maybe 10 or 15 minutes? Absolutely. I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying this, learning a lot. I really appreciate it. I, I have Thank to you. take one break, but I'm on. Thank you very much. Aaron, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, I just wanted to ask a question that was based on some of the, the things we were discussing before about uh, about psychological damage and even physical brain damage from indoctrination. And it, in your experience, I would wonder if you would elaborate on the idea that if you don't use your brain, that it's like a muscle, that it will atrophy. And if you're, and my suspicion would be that if you're raised in an authoritarian society where you were taught to believe, and you're not taught to be analytical as you know, secular, non, you know, non-believing atheist children would be that maybe there's a certain degree of atrophy in your cognitive abilities as an adult. I, I think it's a, a, a reasonable hypothesis, and that's why one of my interests is, you know, what can we do? What what can we do to? And I think this is where we need good social psychologists running good controlled. Experiments. We we know, for instance, why such programs like Head Start work, and why other programs don't. And and I think we want to we want to find those those social psychologists who will. Could you expand do, on that, Andy? Do, because it's not something I'm familiar with. Head I'm Start. Sorry. I'm sorry. In this country, in this country, there have been interests in trying to uh, provide programs that help impoverished children to get them up to speed so that they don't fail educationally. And, and one of the programs was called Head Start. And, and uh, very young children, preschool children, got intensive help. And all sorts of programs were put into place 
before they were researched to find out what programs worked and which programs didn't. And there's a growing psychological, uh, social psychology literature on, you know, researching the social programs for children that work versus the ones that don't, where they actually do control groups and, and really rigorous methodology. And I think we want to do that kind of research on what are the kind of programs that help children develop uh, critical thinking skills, skepticism, um, uh, uh, resisting uh, belief until they've seen the evidence. Uh, I, I, I think we really want to we really want to look at that and try to understand that. I mean, we we know that we're vulnerable to supernatural beliefs. It's part of the the clunky hardwiring of our brain. Okay, we also know that we have the capacity for reason and analytic skills. How do you have a child like Concordance's child, who sounds like a curious, skeptical seven-year-old, how do we get to that point with a young child versus the children, probably the seven-year-old of the uh, woman who our last caller was uh, uh, married to? Sent out to preach on the streets. It's exactly. One of, one of the most sickening sights uh, yes. and, I've and, seen on YouTube is a, a five-year-old, I think, who was uh, encouraged to go uh, street preaching, um, and uh, you know he, he was just a puppet of his father, um, and would stand on the street, you know, telling the you know faggots are going to burn in hell and everything like that. And you just think, what chance has this child got uh, exactly. when when he's by the age of five? Is being exactly. so it's nothing. I mean, the the Islamic lot they have take great pride in these sort of five year olds who can recite the Quran. Hmm. Like all the life skills that you can develop, uh, it's all yeah, going to be particularly useful in a. And they probably don't understand it, but they can recite it. If 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 you're interested, look up a, a book and a video called Army of Roses. It's about. Uh, suicide bombers. It's about um, women suicide bombers, and I'm I'm blocking on the name of the journalist that both did the book and the video. And in the video, she has some absolutely frightening scenes of these schools uh, where uh, young girls and young children are uh, it, it, the exact same thing you were describing are 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 taught to hate and to and, and basically not to think. And it's right. Well, and I, you've given me a whole load of links that I'm going to have to add to these videos. I hope you can provide me with them. But if I, if I remember glad. rightly, um, I heard a lecture by yourself again, which I think is available on YouTube, uh, in which you talk about the mentality of the suicide bomber. Am I? Have I got, I've got the right person. Yes. And one of the most important things that you said in that video, as far as I was concerned, is the reason these people do it is because they do actually believe in it. They are convinced of it. And I think, if I remember rightly, you, you gave the example of the uh, unsuccessful, mildly unsuccessful, um, car bomb attack on Glasgow Airport, in which yeah. the two involved got out of the car and covered themselves in petrol and set themselves alight. One of them survived for several days, if not 30 days or something. The only part of his body that was intact, so to speak, was his genitalia because he had covered it up sufficiently to ensure that he could enjoy the virgins in heaven. Am I uh, accurate in that recollection? Well, actually, it, 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 you, you've got two, two stories condensed. Sorry. Um, yes. No, but you're close. The, the, Glasgow, the Glasgow bombers... The airport bombers. Uh, one was a physician. I think the other was an engineering student. And it's the engineering student that uh, was burned badly, and he he died. And they made the comment that one of the ironies was the only part of his body that wasn't burned were his genitals. And in that talk, I also mentioned the suicide bombers who have failed, and they have actually uh, captured some of them. They were not able to carry out their attack, and, and, and these were mostly young boys, indoctrinated, brainwashed young boys, and some of them had their genitals wrapped in 
paper towels and tissue paper. And when asked about it, they were saying they were protecting their genitals for the virgins in paradise. And the point that you raised at the beginning of your question was one that Sam Harris makes, which is that we in the West are not used to, very often, people who not just believe, but they really believe this stuff. And they're willing to die for it, and they're willing to kill us for it. And that uh, it, it's something we often forget. It is indeed, and I'm acutely aware of the time. I know it's opening. I, Sunday, I know it's opening a lot of topics. Please, Sunday, keep it quick because we've got the caller waiting. It's and I'm very quick. I mean, it's it's a minor thing, but you can't but help notice that one of those bombers was a physician. You know, how does he actually reconcile Hippocratic oath with blowing people up? Well, that that's a, a that's a that is a that shows the power of religious belief. I mean, this was an Two intelligent everything. This was an intelligent, exactly. This is how religion poisons everything. Here was an intelligent, educated man who was a physician. Um, most people forget that Ayman al-Zawahari, number two in al-Qaeda, was a physician. And by all accounts was actually a very good physician. Here was somebody who in the early part of his life was dedicated to putting bodies back together and, and became the, the, one of the masterminds of 9-11. He's Dr. Ayman al-Zawahari. Yeah, I like Billy I have to insist that we take the next question because uh, it's five. Well, Aaron, if you can keep it to 30 seconds, go on. But yeah, we, Billy Connolly said he didn't want 72 question. virgins. Give me two fire-breathing horse. <laughs> okay, it's less than 30 seconds. Thank you. Um, welcome, finally, to the caller. Um, Alexander. Pleasure to be here. Can you hear me well? We can indeed. Excellent. All right, so um, earlier, a couple of you made the jocular comment that you could rewrite the Ten Commandments better than God did, or whatever. And I, kind I, of I was one of them, yes. Go yeah. On. And it's not just you guys. This is something that the Richard Dawkins Foundation, I think Thunderfoot made a, a video about it, saying that we need like an advertising campaign to push the things that somebody did rewrite, or whatever. Not really sure exactly what it is or what they're asking for, but aside, this is sort of... So let me, let me just put the little plug in here. So the uh, Richard Dawkins Foundation, um, <laughs> I've got this thing going for, you know, write a list of rules, it doesn't have to be 10, and if you are the winning entry, they'll, um, get, they'll, they'll be printing them up and having them out of the Reason Rally, which is the 24th of March this year, it's going to be the largest secular gathering in history, so be there or regret it for the rest of your life. I'll come back to that in a, in a moment, Thunder, when I wrap things up. But sorry, did you have a? I think you were going somewhere with the with your point. Yeah, um, it seemed it, it took me kind of by surprise. I was kind of aghast that none of you were aghast at what you were saying because suddenly we're pushing the same kind of command morality that we've hated from religion all this time. So, so the kind of thing I'm asking is. Can morality be something in the form of a commandment? Is command yes. morality something this panel wishes to yes. endorse? How about uh, yes? I, no. Can I can I, can I deal with this first concordance and then I'll come to you? Um, of course it can, and the way in which it is done is it is re reflected and represented by the laws that uh, are passed by our elected parliaments or governments and enforced. Um, for example, um, we. Well, most people uh, accept that the likes of paedophilia and rape are wrong. That is reflected in law, and that is reflected in the way that uh, that law is enforced and the punishments that are given to those that um, do that. So in that regard, yes, I have no problem whatsoever in um, a collective uh, body of people, a society, creating laws and rules by which they live. So I... I, I don't think that the idea that this is sort of like um, because it's not God given or I, I'm trying to replicate God. No, these are just social norms that must be reflected in to ensure a viable social existence. Now, whatever we write that we would call a commandment. Oh, that, that before, we would, just before, just before, I think the caller wants to come back on a point that I've made before we move on. Um, no, that was it. I was adding to your. He was complaining about it. Yeah, being go, go ahead on. Okay, I, I apologize. I'm sorry. Man. Okay. And what we're talking about is what, to the best that we can gather, 
that humanity as a whole considers a legal mandate and being a legal mandate and a moral mandate. We could call it a commandment, even if there's not anyone making the command, even if it's just the norms of our own species as, as a global whole. We could call it a commandment in that respect. So what it sounds like, I would argue that there's sort of a conflation going on here between universal morality and what I would call command morality. And an example I'd like to quote that I thought up here is, let's say someone makes a law that you can't drop anyone from higher than 100 feet. And as soon as we become a space-faring uh, civilization, the, the question you have to ask is, does this make sense to enforce on the moon? And of course, as a law and legislation, you can change the laws, but then it's not really a commandment, is it? It's something else that's able to refine is this more yeah, and, and the other argument? beauty of it is that although we, uh, that everybody here on this panel, or in Western culture, all adheres to the same sorts of limitations. When you when you when you keep the list at ten or less, then we're all going to agree pretty well. But when you get outside of that, uh, then and, and when even perhaps when you're doing just the ten, you may get to specifics that we don't want to that we can't agree on because there really isn't an objective moral standard. But the point of that is not whether there actually is an objective moral standard or not. The, the point of it is that humanity has better morality than what is being promoted in the Bible. That's exactly what I would have said. That's, I think, much more the point of the exercise is to highlight that um, almost anyone can sit down with a pen and paper and write ten commandments that uh, would resonate with more people than those in the Bible. Um, and, you know, you, you sit down and think about that for a second. You know, that any arbitrary person can write down ten better commandments than God, if that makes any sense. Um, and even, you know, Jesus is, you know, our, arguably his crowning achievement to do unto others as you would have them do unto you can be arguably more extremely quoted as thoughtful reciprocation. You know, and it's funny that you bring that up, Thunder, because when I was a little kid, uh, when I used to get these these lectures about you know uh, the subjective moral standard and everything, I remember bringing up to my family, and I and I mean as a child, you know, very young child, you know, like eight. I remember bringing up to the to my family that you know you have the Muslims and you have the Buddhists and you have the Hindus and you have all these different religions, and so far as I could tell at the time, and it turned out to be true, that in large part they all promoted what we now call the golden rule or dif different variants of that, which is the one that you just cited. So why don't we just have that? And, of course, that uh, that was not well received by my family. Uh, you, you, yeah, you only need the one golden rule, which is be excellent to each other. Can I go back to the caller? Because there was, <laughs> can, I, can I go back to the caller? Because there's a point that I didn't fully understand. You were trying to... Um, bring a, a, an example of not dropping someone from 100 feet, but then we became something different and that law no longer would apply. I didn't fully understand what you were trying to say there. Um, based my understanding of how I would define a commandment is that it's something that will be true forever and always. And that sort of thing, it, 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 that, that just sounds to me like the, kind of the way a fiat must work. And yeah. so yeah, if well, you have something like that... We, it, I think we, we were talking about replacing commandments with something a little more flexible, a little more meaningful. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, I think on Sunday, well, well, not please, on Sunday, one, not one at a time. Graven idols. No graven images, not working on Sunday. Uh, those well, really it's rather like the Constitution. Well, no, I, I'm sorry, I think, we're, I think we're all missing the point. So far as I understand it, you're saying there's a difference between commandments and the, the sorts of things that we would accept as accept, uh, laws. What is, is, you're all sort of getting at, at least what my understanding of my interpretation, is that you would rather be pushing something like the ten guidelines or the ten suggestions, the things that generally work. I think I think that you probably um, may have overread too much into what we were saying. Um, if we were going to rewrite the Bible, then certainly we could um, give better commandments. Um, but I don't think anyone here is suggesting that we would want uh, to give commandments. Yes, because in reality, neither would we offer unimaginable rewards that we won't show you any proof of and therefore we'll never have to pay. And neither 
would we condemn anyone for any reason to an eternal damnation and torture? I have a, maybe a, an interesting uh, question for everyone to answer. Maybe it's worth wrapping this up. If we were to rewrite the Bible, the Bible is currently about 2,000 pages long. How long do you think it would be? Two <laughs> side, or one, one side of A4, maybe? How, how, how big do you think the Bible would be if it were rewritten? I'm going to go for... Yeah. But it depends enough. what you want, Thunder. Um, I think you're going to have okay, to be a little bit more specific. Can I make a suggestion? There, 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 there will be a second. front side of the Bible and the back side. You know? no, what, what I need to understand, do, you want, do you want do you want your moral guidance to be wrapped up in a nice fictional book, or do you just want the basic point by point fact? Oh, because on, if, if it's, no, a, if it's the, the latter, Bible, it, it, if it's it, the latter, it, then I'm going for two sides of A4. Okay, I, I would suggest that if we're going to, if we would rewrite the Bible, and I know this is just a joke, but if we were going to do that, let's set it for, you know, an intended readership from around 4,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, something like that. How would we have written it? And see if we could do better than a, than a supposedly supreme being. That's fair. And the advances on two sides of A4 for the uh, Bible Mark II? Because <laughs> <laughs> the next thing is going to be, of course, if it's only going to be two sides of A4, why hasn't someone written it yet? Yeah, and, and somewhere in there, there has to be some quotable passage that some, some little old lady will post up in her bathroom wall, as they so often do. That, you, know, that would, that you have the little quotable quotes, like just like the regular Bible has, but we would have something like, if it requires faith to believe it, don't. Well, that's almost a contradiction in itself, though, isn't it? <laughs> um, but no, I mean, um, I suppose the the danger of brevity is that it can lead open uh, the opportunity for interpretation and multiple interpretations. I'm, 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 I just, I'm just thinking now. You know, you distill down the actual informational content of the Bible. That's where I was coming from. Just, Two sides yeah, of it. Just, 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 just pointless blurb. You know, well, it, you can get, just, book, you can get rid of the, you can get the rid of the book of Numbers, Joshua and Ruth straight away. I mean, there's nothing in there. Of any yeah, you can get you rid can of all the bits the about everybody. About two paragraphs. Everybody whose head got nailed to the floor with tent stakes. Everybody that 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 had to go and smite and destroy all the animals and all the people and all the children of some neighboring town. Yeah, you can just forget exactly. all of that. You, you, and you, you, you can write a book that tells people how they should be with each other. It tells people how the universe is. How about one that gives people the idea that the Earth is not flat? And that about it's this? not the center of the universe or the biggest thing there is in space. That would be a nice thing to have. I mean, if I were a supreme being, I would want people to have some concept that maybe the, 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 the light that comes up over there and goes down over there doesn't really do that. It just looks like it. You're the one that's moving. You're talking I'd like to be people of Feynman. I've got a motivational poster for you, the Bible. The only book that makes more sense is you delete more of its chapters. <laughs> on that note, on that, <laughs> on that groundbreaking note, uh, thank you very much, uh, Alex. I'm going to remove you. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I'd like to talk more, um, but I noticed the time. Um, can I thank everyone that's come along and watched? And can I thank in particular? Um, firstly, Tony, who doesn't get enough of a mention. Tony is the technical person working behind the scenes to bring you this show in all its glory. So thank you very much to Tony. Thumbs up for him, please. Thank you also to the usual suspects, um, Aaron, Concordance, and uh, Thunderful. Any last words from any of you? Yeah, I'd like to bring up that uh, I have once again been invited to speak at the Darwin Day celebration in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, hosted by the Center for Inquiry and the James Randi Educational Foundation and a number of other organizations. I have a list that I need to provide. I'll do a promotional video on that effect, but I'm, I'm very happy to be there. Um, the, the, the Florida people are always uh, an excellent crowd. They're wonderful hosts. I can't wait for the trip. 
And anybody that happens to be down there, please attend. Thanks, Aaron. Concordance? No, uh, everybody kind of knows what's going on in my neck of the world. Um, well, concordance, I think I'm going to ask for a thumbs up. In fact, no, not a thumbs up, because I'll get confused with other ones. What should we go for? Two uh, thumbs up! Uh, yeah, we'll go for two <laughs> thumbs up if people think that Concordance should write a book about how to bring up children. So that's a double two thumbs, thumbs up. Two thumbs up and a woot. Two thumbs up and, and a, a woot. woot. Oh, well, look at that's, that. That's there we go. But there you go. There's your, there's your task for the... Well, uh, that's one of the two lines. projects that I will be working on. One of them will be uh, a science answer show that we're going to be doing once a week. And the other one is going to be um, curricular material on critical thinking that we hope to make available to educators. Absolutely, okay. and I will be uh, happy to promote. No, you had your last word, Aaron. There's, there's a lot of your last thumbs word. and whoops there, concordance. I, I think concordance <laughs> wins that one. Uh, yeah. There goes Thunder, my uh, parent of the year award. Thunder's got no last words for once, which is great. Oh, so I can good, turn good, to good our, job, Tony. Oh, thank you. Uh, I can and, to and special many thanks to Andy. I can. T- <laughs> and I think I can cut through you one more time. <laughs> right. I just remove your thunder. I have that power. Um, to our special guest, Andy Thompson, thank you very much indeed for taking up your time. Uh, it's been an absolute, absolute pleasure to have you. I hope you've enjoyed it. And I hope that, uh, a, a, sometime in the future you may consider coming back. Anytime. Uh, oh, and thank you. And seeing as you've given us so much of your time, I think it's only right that we should give a shout out for your book. Uh, Why Do We Believe in God or Gods by Andy Thompson. I shall put the link in the uh, videos to uh, the site where you can buy it from. But if you look at it on Amazon or richarddawkins.net, you will find it. Andy Thompson, thank you very much indeed. We will be back in two weeks' time uh, with David Silverman, hopefully. And in February, I'm not sure what date exactly, we should also have Dr. Lona Frank, uh, appearing on the show, that will be a discussion about the denigration of science. I'm going to say goodbye, but before I do, I have one message for one particular special person, and this won't mean anything to anyone else, but Catherine, I love you. Okay, thank you very much indeed. We shall see you all in two weeks' time. Take care.